<clears throat> Denise and I are really honored to be here. Uh, it's really hardest to get invited to a party when it's next door, you know. It's, <laughs> so I really appreciate it, even though I guess uh, if you don't know where the Upper Peninsula is, that's that part of Michigan that gets left off the maps occasionally. You know, that's that part up here. We live on the north coast of Michigan, which is right next to Lake Superior, not Canada. It's close, but it's a little waterways away. Some people will get that confused too. But uh, we're really honored to be here, and even though I'm probably going to do most of the talking this morning or this afternoon, I really want you to make sure you know Denise sitting right here with blonde hair. She is a full partner and a, a cooperator and manager of our operation, and if you want to know, see if you get the same story, ask her questions too, because she'll... Uh, She'll have an answer for you. Most of the time, they're kind of the same, but not always the same. So it's good to get two perspectives. So this is Denise right here, and definitely I want to give her a lot of credit, and that's why we're both speaking, even though uh, listed as speakers, even though maybe I'm doing most of the talking, because she's definitely a full partner in the operation. So we're really honored to be here. We want to talk about grazing and soil health, and Luke really kind of set me up uh, just before dinner talking about soil, uh, the sunshine harvesting. We're going to be touching on that also, but we're really kind of keying in on the whole soil health thing. What I want to tell you is that what we want to key on is, is the idea that grazing is you that manage how your livestock eat the plants and that how those plants are eaten feed the soil, okay, that feed the plants, that feed the livestock, that feed you. This is a circular system. It all works together. And I've worked with grazing for 30 some years or though, and we, we kind of skipped this healthy soil part. And really in the last few years, I began to realize that's kind of been a missing link and help explains lots of things. But I want to repeat it, the idea that you manage the livestock to eat the forage that feeds the plants, that feeds the soil, that feeds the plants, that feeds the livestock, that feeds you. So these are the four winds, and we need all four winds, okay? Traditionally, we thought about grazing as, you know, we start at 10 inches and we eat it down to four inches or we take half and leave half. And that's kind of a reductionist management way of thinking. You know, it's just like soil is N, P, and K on an available basis. Uh, maybe we just worry about how animals performed or income is profit per animal. And those are kind of the traditional things. We haven't thought about the system. And what we really need to think when we throw soil health in there is to think more about the ideas that, that we've been leaving out the life in the soil. And one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was, what is healthy soil? And you'll see the answers, now that you even didn't see the questions, because the answers will come up in red. That healthy soil, to me, there's a whole bunch of definitions, like aggregate and all sorts of stuff. To me, it's just abundant life. If we have abundant life in our soil, we have healthy soil. And that's really all we need to know. If there's lots of life there, it's a healthy soil. And if there's not much life there, it's not as healthy a soil as it can be. But is the life working for us? You know, are we integrating our management to do it? And I really want you to think about this, that long-term long success of living systems can only come with all the components winning. You can't have winning with some of the components losing, which is kind of what we have with a lot of our agriculture today. We're getting more corn every year off an acre of ground as we're losing more soil organic matter. And remember what one of last, Luke's last slides showed you? It was four civilizations that went down because it's lost its capacity to grow food. So we may be getting more, you say, hey, what's the problem? Corn yields go up every year, but at what cost? So you cannot have a long-term success with a living system unless every component wins, okay? Keep that in mind. My goals for this session are to talk a little bit about soil health, uh, how soil health and plants and uh, all, livestock all work together. We, talk, we did a SARA trial uh, that we've really learned a lot, and mostly what we learned is we don't know that much yet. We're working on it, though. And then we're going to try to turn it into some things that hopefully it can take home, because it's really fun to come to conferences, hear a bunch of new ideas, but I really want to leave you something that, okay, you can go home and you can say, yeah, I want to do that. And we'll give you the three keys, what I think is. This very short version of soil health, because I know a lot of you know all this stuff already, but I just, photosynthesis, <clears throat> want to repeat it so we're kind of all on the same, same level here. Photosynthesis produce carbon products for the plant. 40% uh, of those photosynthates, 
the things that the carbohydrates that the plant produces are excreted by the roots. Exudates and the dying roots feed the bacteria and the fungi, the BNF. Bacteria and fungi trade water, nutrients for carbon and sugar. The organisms secrete the gums and the aggregates to hold the, the soil together, okay? So there's really this very important relationship between them. Most of the nutrients are in organic form in the soil, not inorganic, which is available to the plants. When you get a traditional soil test, you get the NPK or the P and K that's immediately available. It doesn't really tell you how much P and K is in your soil. Because in reality, a silt soil has 1,000 pounds of N. Why are we putting nitrogen fertilizer in it if it's already got 1,000 pounds of N? Or 1,000 pounds of phosphorus, 7,000 potassium, okay? The key is, is that 85% of all nutrients are microbially uh, mediated. Bacteria play a role in making them available to the plant. So you can have all those minerals in the ground, but the plant get to them, can't get to them unless the bacteria are functioning, okay? Hold your breath. All right. So the system is the sun up here. And again, I told you, Luke really set things up. Sun and green leaves, photosynthesis, produces its carbohydrate or sugar, feeds the microbes. The microbes eat the organic matter in the soil. They release CO2, and that goes back up, and you get this cycle going. You'll see this just, just cycles all over. That's really great on this soil health thing. Everything's kind of working together to help each other. Here's another schematic that talks about how you got the sun, the oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the water. So the plant is feeding the bugs down there, and then the bugs turn around, they fix nitrogen, they provide the plants uh, with protection, more minerals, uh, improved soil structure, that's a ground, groundland, that's really critical, that soil aggregates, we don't want co uh, compacted soil. This is really interesting because we talk about carbon uh, CO2, and the photosynthesis, and we think about this carbon, there's like, there's a lot of just, a lot of CO2 up there, right? I mean, we're putting too much up there already. That's a big problem. What is air made out of? What's the number one component of air? How much? 80, 77%, 89%, 79%, whatever. What's number two? Oxygen. That's 20-some. How much does that leave? Not much, right? Carbon dioxide is about 0.03 or 0.04 percentage of the atmosphere. There's really not that much CO2 up in the air, okay? So to get photosynthesis, you need CO2, and where does a lot of it come from? The rapid deep condition, decomposition of the organic matter. That CO2, when it's released, actually doesn't go up in the air. It's caught, captured by the plant, and this cycle repeats itself, okay? So this is why it's so important. We talk about having green cover, green leaves, when you till up a piece of ground and you release a whole bunch of organic matter that gets eaten up by the microbes, where does the CO2 go? All the way up. There's nothing to catch it, okay? So having that green cover is really critical. However, nitrogen is often our most limiting plant nutrient, and so we use a lot of chemical in to, to make grass grow. You know, and I'm, I'm the first one to buy my nitrogen fertilizer for my hay fields every spring. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But I just ran across a paper out of a guy at a uh, University of Illinois, you know, Corn City down there, talking about how synthetic nitrogen fertilizers deplete soil in. And it's a global dilemma for s cereal production around the world. Cut through what he's saying there is as we put on more nitrogen fertilizers, less available in the soil. In other words, our nitrogen that we're adding is making the nitrogen supply in the soil worse. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. But that's a big deal. And a lot of you know we need biological in. Ironically, this information is not new. It started about 1920. We actually had a lot of information out there coming out of Sweden. Anybody that's read Solvita's website uh, from William Britton will talk about how back in the 20s and 30s we had a lot of this information. And uh, it got... We could chemically make fertilizer, and all of a sudden this biological stuff got just all shoved to the backside, okay? But it's not that simple. This is grass getting high on nitrogen, okay? You see the green strip of grass there? Can, is, can you see that color in the back of the room there? And to the left is kind of brown and gray? Okay, here's the rest of the story. This is a hay field away from our place. We don't... We don't graze it very, or only rare occasions because it's too far away. 
So I put some nitrogen, about 40, 50 pounds on it in the springtime, take a first cutting of hay, and then usually we don't even take a second cutting of hay. This year we cut it at the end of June, it never rained in July. It came up and didn't go anywhere, and it looks really brown and, and just didn't grow much all summer long because we were pretty marginal on moisture all summer long. At the bottom of the screen happens to be a turnip field that I put in on the 1st of August. So on the 15th of August, I took a bunch of load of fertilizer over there to fertilize my turnips and ryegrass and sunflowers and a few other things I threw in the mix. And as I pulled out of the field, I said, just for the heck of it, I'm going to scatter a little bit on this hay field and see what happens. So I drove out there. You can actually, if you look up under the N and the D, you can see the wheel tracks from the tractor and the fertilizer spreader there. And I spread that fertilizer, and that was about a month ago. We got a nice rain, about three quarters of an inch of rain, the best rain we've had all summer. And Denise and I were over there just a couple days ago looking at this, and it's like, holy smokes, where did this come from? The field's brown, it's way on the back edge, the road is over by that house. You don't even see it. And what happened was, that's where I spread that fertilizer. So it really looks really lush. I mean, there's a good ton, ton and a half of dry matter there, because that's really thick orchard grass that's come up. So we took our Sylveta test. How many know about what a Sylveta test is? Okay, a few, few hands go up. That measures the CO2 given off by the soil with the idea that when we breathe in oxygen, what do we give off? CO2, okay, so do bugs. The amount of CO2 given off by a piece of ground, a piece of soil, is directly proportional to how many bugs there, okay? More bugs, more CO2. So you can measure the CO2 given off by a sample of soil and get an indication of how many bugs are there, okay? I'm going to ask you a question, and you all got to vote. We did a Sylveta test on the brown grass that was fertilized once this spring with nitrogen and nothing done all summer, and this lush green stuff here that was fertilized 30 days ago. So how many people think there's more active bugs under the green grass? Raise your hand. A few. How many think there's more bugs underneath the dead grass? Very, it is not a trick question. It's an interesting question. There is 31% more CO2 given off by the dead grass ground than there is by it underneath where the lush green grass is. Okay? You would think that, boy, it's really looking great underneath there, but that nitrogen fertilizer is making welfare bugs. It's just saying, you don't need to work, man. That guy will feed you. And he'll feed you next year, and he'll feed you some more. And they're saying, okay, we'll just wait for it to show up. Remember that paper I showed you where they're saying that nitrogen application is actually making cereal production around the world in danger because it keeps lowering the amount of in? The more fertilizer they put on, the worse our fields get in some ways because they're not dependent on their own system working. We're giving them a crutch, and when their leg heals, we're not taking it away. We're leaving it there. And I thought this was kind of a, you know, there's good theory, and then there's driving out there and saying, wow, what happened here? And it was really kind of fun to take a Sylveta test and see what really happened. So there's more microbial activity in that dead side than there is in the right side over here. And of course, you guys are sharp. You got it already. So what happens? Where, what's going on with this whole bugs, and, and um, how does this, my system work? Well. This is a root system and there's a rhizosphere. Rhizosphere is that area around the roots where all the bugs live. And bacteria, fungi, maybe, not all of them, but there's a high density there. And that's where the root exudate comes out, so that's where the bugs are at. And that's where a lot of this interchange goes on. In addition to bacteria, we got fungi. This is mycelium here. And that, actually the fungi go between the roots they're smaller than root hairs, and they actually even go into the root hairs. So you have root hairs that you and I don't see. We pull up a plant, and we shake the dirt off if the dirt will come off, which hopefully it won't, because it means it's got good glomerulin and sticking to it. And what we don't even see is all these root hairs, because in the mycelium, and that'll increase the root capacity by up to 700 times. So fungi and bacteria are extremely important to having a healthy root system, okay? And you only get that by exercising it. 
So I want to get review this short version of this plant soil barter system that goes on, you know, because believe it or not, everybody is out there looking out for themselves, including the plants, including the bugs. The plants just don't say, oh, we'll give you some carbohydrate and I hope you bring us back some nitrogen, you know, it really doesn't go on that way. What happens is that exudate comes out of the carbohydrates, bacteria and fungi eat it, and they reproduce. And keep in mind, bacteria populations can double in 20 minutes. I mean, we're talking a serious population explosion here, okay? Bacteria and fungi have a three to one carbon nitrate ratio. This is important. Protozoa eat this new abundance of bacteria and fungi. I mean, when you get lots of rabbits, then what do you get? Lots of coyotes, right? I mean, this is kind of how it works. So the protozoa and coyotes, they go eat the bacteria and fungi. When they eat three bacteria, how many carbon molecules do they get? Nine. How many nitrogen molecules do they get? Three. How many do they need? One. What do they do with the other two? Poop them out in a nitrate form that, holy smokes, it's available for the plant. This is a very simplified version, and I'm sure a lot of you kind of They've been exposed to this already, but I think it's really good to keep reminding yourself that this, this active system is, is everybody out for themselves, but they found this mutually advantageous way to kind of live together where it's win-win for everybody. I think and that's really critical. Soil health, I do have my notes here. Minimize tillage, that's the one I can remember. Minimize tillage and keep live roots in the ground. We know that any kind of pasture does that. Even the overgrazing set stock for all summer long, eat it like a golf course. It has live roots in it. There, nobody's plowing it. What it doesn't do, that overgrazed gopher tillage or that gopher grazing doesn't keep the ground covered. And that's really critical, as Gabe says. You know, it protects the soil, catches the rain, moderates the temperature. It's really critical. And then a diversity of plants. Because to feed a whole bunch of different bugs, we need a whole bunch of different plants. And the more different kinds of bugs we got, the more different kinds of nutrients we can mobilize to make available for the plants. When we only got one kind of plant, we only got one set of bugs that live there. There's, there's literally millions of kind of bacteria. And when people think about how many identifying the bacteria in the soil, we're not even close. I mean, there's just tons of bacteria down there. Nobody knows who they are or what they do or anything else. Um, and so it's, it's a really unexplored territory. I put this slide in here, and I wasn't sure, I, I, I don't know where the right place is, but it's something that I want to make sure you have in the back of your mind. You've heard of long-term studies. Well, this one's 134 years, okay? This is a pretty good long-term study. This was out in Oregon, started in 1881, and what they were doing was measuring organic matter under their, this would be the Palouse country where they raise a lot of wheat. And for up until 1926, they just raised wheat, and you can see what the organic matter did. That's the dotted line. It just went down, down, down. And then they started different, doing some different things since uh, 26 to, I don't know how many more years that is, but it's another, what, 80 years or so. And you can see that everything except manure caused a continual decrease of organic matter. Manure is the only thing on those fields that actually kind of leveled it out. It didn't even increase the organic matter. So when we talk about our whole system, our agriculture system being win-win, we got to figure out how to make that line go up because we cannot go on forever going down, okay? And even, um, you know, just, just saying I got cows on the ground isn't good enough. They got to be managed properly. So that's really critical. Does grazing grass, in fact, impact the microbial population? And I got to credit or blame grass-fed conference in Nebraska, where I heard Dr. Lee Mansky talk about how uh, teaching a grazing course that says grazing immature forage to stimulate microbial action to graze to grow more forage. And I thought, wow, that's a neat concept. And and he was kind of a. Anybody remember hearing him back a few years ago? Doug, you must have heard him. It was really interesting conversation because he was kind of the, a professoral type person, you know, with a suit coat and everything on, and he gets into all these equations and, and reference papers and everything else. And then at five minutes before he gets done with his talk, he says, now, 
none of that's important. And it's like, oh man, I just, I just about got me hooked. And now you say it's not important. I don't know what to do now. And what, what he said was, what we really need is people on the land. If we can grow more grass and do it on the same piece of land, we can run more cows and we can have families make a reasonable living on a piece of ground. That's what's important. It's like, hallelujah. You know, he took it from the microbial level, minuscule issues to the big picture of having more people on the land, which I thought was really fantastic. In addition, there's a paper by Hamilton out of 2001 that plants capable of promoting rhizophilic microbial populations, those bugs close to the roots, facilitate intake of limiting soil resources, assuming positive mechanism, herbivory, did I get it? Yep. Whoa, herbivory, you thought they were just eating grass out there, you know, that's herbivory. <laughs> Promotes plant growth as well as energy and nutrient flows and great landscape. I, I think the interesting part of this was this was 2001. So, we're, you know, we had the biology stuff back in the 20s and 30s, but the whole grazing part of it, I mean, we know about soil health and cover crops, but the grazing part is relatively new how it really impacts it. So I, we, Denise and I heard Mansi's talk out there and really got curious, like, so Dr. Mansi's doing this in western Dakotas on dry land and warm season grasses to a certain degree, some cool season. We're in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan on four soils. What's it going to do for us? Is it going to work for us? Okay. So we wanted to measure that. We did a zillion soil test in 2014. We did like $5,000 worth of soil test. That's a lot of probing, let me tell you. <laughs> and we didn't find out what we wanted to find out, but we learned a lot, okay? <laughs> so in 2014, what we found out, we, here's what we did. We did four periods, early and late first grazing, midsummer and, and fall. We ran a little Haney in a PLFA test. Haney test is kind of a bio lot. It's like traditional toil test, measures the inorganic availability of a P and K and in, in, in N if it's nitrate. The Haney test looks at the biological availability of can that soil convert more of these nutrients. So it takes the biological life into consideration. PLFA measures microbial life by the outside of the microbial uh, organism, okay? So we, here's what we did. We grazed the plots one to two days. We did with both sheep and cattle. And at seven days post-grazing, this was the best advice. We're, neither one of us are soil scientists. You know, I'm a veterinarian, she's a librarian, so we don't know anything about soils, per se. They said seven days, pull your samples. So we did our test, and at seven days, what we found out that the Soveda burst test, the PLFA and the Heaney test, uh, Haney and Sovita were below average and the PLFA was mixed. In other words, we impacted soil health indicators and they were all lower, lower where we grazed than where we didn't graze. So we were pretty bummed out. I mean, we did all this work to prove that grazing was bad for the ground. I mean, it's like something's not right here. So we went back to the book and did more literature review. And then we found out this E. Hamilton guy again in 2008 reported that the feed mechanism is more like 24 to 72 hours. In other words, when you graze a piece of ground, things are happening now. It's not like, you know, a week from now or next year. And so we did the Soveda basal test, which really measured what's happening in that field right now. And we did it at 0, 12, 24, 48, 3, 5, and 7 days post grazing. In other words, we wanted to see, could we give up on proving any other, can we just ch catch the impact of grazing on soil health? I mean, all literature says it happens, but we wanted to see it ourselves. There's a little Solvita test, put the soil in there, just a picture out of their book, put this little paddle in there, cover it up, wait so many a length of time, and it will change color. If it stays blue, it doesn't mean you, much have, you don't have much CO2. It's that if it turns more towards yellow on that color chart, then you got more CO2 in the ground, okay? So here's what we found. If we looked at our grazing, versus the control plots, at zero hours post-grazing, we had 5% more CO2 given off by the graze plots than we did the control plots. And as it got after grazing, up to 24 hours, we, could, we maxed it out at over 25% more CO2 given off by the graze plots than the other plots. And you see at seven days, we actually had a negative impact. It's like 
which said, yeah, that's what happened the year before. You know, when you measured it seven days, you didn't see the impact. Nitrate levels, because what we really don't care how many bugs are down there. What we really want is the bugs to change organic nitrogen and nitrate so it's available for the plants. The nitrate levels, the top line, so we did have more nitrate where we grazed versus the bottom line was control. That's the good news. The bad news was you see the numbers in the left margin are about two. That means there's about 10 or 12 pounds of nitrogen per acre. We needed 100 pounds, and we're not sure why we got such a low score. In fact, that's in 2014, we figured out we weren't testing quick enough. In 2015, we caught it, and we were really happy that, yes, grazing does impact the CO2, the man microbial life, but why is the nitrate so low? And I call the people we're supposed to know, and it's like, boy, you have super healthy soil. We don't know why the nitrate's not there, so we're working on that one. Um, when we said post-grazing, if we put them in a plot for two days, when we take them out, is that exactly post-grazing? Maybe that plant got grazed when you walked in there. So maybe that was two days. I mean, all these things really confounded. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't just because you took them out at zero hours doesn't mean they ate it all like five minutes before you walked out, out of that paddock, okay? Um, but we want to find out, you know, Everybody thinks mob grazing is fantastic, and I do too. But it, how much better is it than one day or three day or maybe a 10 day? Does it make a difference how much plant removed? We did, a, we did a little sequence here just a couple days ago, and we come out and we did a, where we're grazing lambs, we weaned lambs. They only take maybe a third, 40% of the forage, and then we're letting the ewes clean up behind them, and here, we had a paddock that they cleaned up. I mean, there's not much left. And we didn't see any difference. So there's just a ton of things to learn. So there's a whole bunch. Now, one other thing I want to throw out to you, just what does trampling do? If we ran a, a, a bunch of animals through a piece of ground or ran over it with a cull packer and knocked it all down, maybe at a sheep's foot. Anybody know what a sheep's foot is, like a construction equipment? What happened if we ran a sheep foot across the pasture? Would we stimulate microbial action because we've stressed that plant and pushed, pushed that plant down on the ground? Or does it have to be a cow's hoof? You know, I think, I think those are kind of questions we really need to think about how we get an answer for, okay? But I want to take you into, you know, all this theory in soil health is fun. I mean, it's kind of interesting to know all these things. But really the bottom line is what can you take home? What can you do? This, you know, and it's this kind of stuff that, that I can relate to. I like to see newborn lambs and ewes out on this really great lush grass and everybody's doing good and, and that's kind of when you're making money or that kind of ground. So I think the three keys uh, to, to managing graze management is you grow, and you graze, and you regrow, okay? So you grow the plant first. You want to harvest it after three to three and a half leaves. And here's an example plant where it's a ryegrass plant, and it's been nipped off or started to grow in the spring, and it grows one, two leaves, one, two, three. I want you to look at the line on the bottom. And you'll see that's a water WSC, water-soluble carbohydrate. When that plant is regrowing, there's no carbohydrates. It uses up all the carbohydrates out of the plant to grow. That's why when you turn cows on this real lush short grass, you know, they poop all over, and it's because there's no carbohydrate in that grass. So it's not only not good for the grass, it's not even good for the animal. And as we get to that three-leaf stage, you can see our carbohydrate levels will build back up that plant's ready to graze. So it tells you when it's ready to graze, okay? So this is to answer another question. What does grazing do to plants, okay? Biting and saliva stimulate grass growth. Cows eating grass stimulates more grass to grow, all right? Increases the root exudate, increases microbial growth, increases nutrients to the plant. Anybody see that, uh, I think it was a National Geographic show, National Geographic show about uh, plants talking to each other. I see a few heads. Yeah, you know where one bug, they take the vibration of a bug eating a leaf and put it up to a next plant and that plant's chemical composition changes to chase the bugs away even though it hasn't even been eaten yet. So that cow eating that plant, it says, holy smokes man, I need to kick it in gear because I just got eaten. 
It literally grows faster if it's eaten than if it just sits there. You know, and we tend to think it's negative, but in a way, proper grazing literally stimulates more grass growth, okay? And then you need to minimize the, the rebiting re or uh, uh, regrazing. Grazing done right is good for the plants and good for soil life. So here's kind of what we've been going on. In the spring, we want to graze one bite uh, to 25% of the plant between three leaves and flowering, okay? And if, and if this happens in 20 days, I know from when we can start grazing, which is about May the 10th to May the 20th, by June the 10th to June the 20th, my orchard grass is headed out, okay? I have 20 graze, 20 days, to take one bite on all my plants. I, ideally, I want to eat that meristem, get that seed head meristem bitten off, okay? And you know how we usually think about how far to graze it down, how much we leave? I'm saying it's kind of a radical idea and say, forget about it. Don't worry about it. If you've got 200 acres to graze, you're going to do it in 20 days. How many acres do you graze a day? Ten. I kind of made the math easy, okay? <clears throat> so if you've got 10, days, 10 acres a day, you give them a 10 acre paddock, and when do you move them? Tomorrow. When do you move them the next day? The next day. I mean, you just keep going. Don't worry about how much they ate. Just keep moving them. Our, we were only taking three and 400 pounds off our pastures this spring. You know, we wanted a bite because literally that plant's growing fast and we want as much green leaf because of collecting sunshine. So we want to leave as much leaf as we can to grow more plant for later on so we don't eat it down very far. Uh, next time around, you can go a lot slower, take up to 40, 50 percent. Uh, quick spring graze shifts that forage into later in the summer. Traditionally, what we, you know, one of the recommendations is that you graze it from this down to this far, and if you, they get too tall, you make hay out of it. Now I'm saying, no, do not clip it, do not make hay. Just take one bite and get through everything, okay? Then you can graze it later on in the summer, and then the fall sets up everything for next spring. I like to tell people that in the springtime, the grass is just like a bunch of teenagers. All they're thinking about is sex, okay? Everything is reproduction. We're either going to throw a seed head, or if you bite that off, then I'm going to till her up. I'm going to reproduce in the spring. And what is a plant thinking about in September? Retirement. <laughs> it's putting down root reserves, man. You know, it didn't have a 401k, and you see what the stock market's done? It says, i got to get ready for next spring, because the stuff you eat in the fall determines what you've got next spring. You've already started next year's grazing season today by what you're doing at home right now. And if you don't believe me, when you drive around next spring, look at the pastures and see whether they're higher on the inside or the outside of the fence. And if the ditches are that high and your pastures are that high, you put in bed hungry last fall. Okay? And maybe some pastures that's okay. Because what you need to do is make sure you don't, you know, the, my, the usual comment is, yeah, but my cow's got to eat something in September, you know, that fall period. What are they going to eat? And it's like, well, one year you eat here, but then next year you eat somewhere else. You always change the rotation so you're not grazing the same thing, okay? So we graze, we grew, we graze, and now we want to regrow. We want apple time for growth and photosynthesis. This, this replenishing is really critical. I know some of you have seen this before, but, and you know I really like it because I think it's really cool. These are two orchard grass plants that are growing in a heat greenhouse. They were managed similarly for six months. Six months they were treated just alike, clipped once a month, had good fertility, okay? And then the left plant you're going to see in this picture, which stimulates, simulates continuous grazing, is clipped to one inch every week. And the other one was clipped to three and a half inches once. And then we started to time lapse photography, okay? So on day one, 24 hours after they've been clipped, and remember, for six months they were treated exactly the same. For only one month were they clipped to one inches on the left or three and a half inches on the right. So this is day one, two, three, four, five, six. Look at the difference in the growth. 
So this is where you started on day one. Two, three, four, five, six. Look at the tremendous difference. How much photosynthesis is going on in the right plant compared to the left plant? How much root exudate is being given off on the right plant versus the left plant? You can't afford to graze it down. You just can't afford to graze it down. Because the other thing that really, you know, kind of supports this whole concept is look at photosynthetic activity, okay? That's the left margin is photosynthetic activity. Higher is more. The canopy height, how much plant you got there. And you can just see there's more uh, sunlight intercepted by the orchard grass the taller it gets. Kind of peaks out at 20 inches or so. So more grass catches more sunshine. If you graze it down to four inches, you actually get a negative. That line there is not zero. That's a minus 100. You get a negative photosynthetic activity if you're grazing that orchard grass that low. So you got your plants as Luke, I said Luke really set me up, you know. You're, sp what, spilling energy? You got an energy spill going on there if you graze your grass down too short. And when you live in the upper, pen upper peninsula of Michigan, you don't waste any sunshine, let me tell you. You know, we have the proverbial nine months of winter, uh, and we need all the sunshine we can get. And this is what's going on below the ground. If you clip it every two days, seven days, every 21 days, this is what kind of root system you got on below the ground. So your management has a huge impact on the health of that plant, which has the health of the microbes, the ability to catch sunshine, to feed more microbes, to provide more nutrients. Uh, it's just really negative. So putting the health uh, principles into practice. Be a soil health learner. Change your grazing management. You know, I know most of you are probably doing a great job already, but is there any place you could do more? Change can be incremental. If you're moving every week, move every three days. If you're moving every three days, maybe you ought to go to an everyday system, all right? The, the, the more density and the shorter period, the more impact we have on the land underneath it. I'm a great believer in mob grazing, but I, you know, my, you know, one of the things being a holistic, uh, manager type person, not only do I want profit, do I want to leave my soil in better case for the future, but I'm also interested in my quality of life and my wife's quality of life, which affects my quality of life. And moving animals six times a day may not be worth it, you know? <laughs> so, you know, but maybe there's times where it is worth it. And I think those are some of the things we need to figure out where, where and when do we really do that. But at least get it down to three days or two days or one day, okay? It's really, that will pay. Get less herds. You know, I got a friend that's got 240 cows and he's got one bull group. I mean, he's forever got a whole bunch of cows, groups all over, you know, get it? Less groups, less groups. Grease faster in the spring and slower in the fall. You've heard that many, many times. But actually put it into practice where you graze everything fast once and then come back around. Quitting fertilizer is more of a challenge, I think, you know, and listen, uh, Christine Jones from Australia, uh, great knowledge on soil health, carbon sequestration, how this whole carbon fits into the whole system. She says with phosphorus, you can go cold turkey because most of the phosphorus fertilizer you put on is tied up by the, or, by the, the soil anyway. Most clay soil has like 10,000 pounds of phosphorus in it. And I can show you clay soils that have a six pound of P on the soil test when you get it back because there's so much cation exchange capacity, it just sucks up that phosphorus and ties it up. So to get phosphorus spilling over, you need to put a ton of fertilizer on. Or you could get the bugs going to work, okay? Nitrogen is not that good. You know, I joked about nitrogen being a drug. Well, literally, if you've been putting a lot of nitrogen on, if you quit next year, it's gonna be ugly. I'm telling you, it'll be ugly. Because those plants, bugs, aren't, they aren't there. It's going to take a while to get them going again. And I've been telling you, you know, we know cover crops and, and those cover mixtures and then grazing with animals, that's a great way to go. But I'm too lazy to grow crops. So how can I manage my grazing animals? And that's why we kind of emphasize that eating a plant is important. The more time you graze it off, the better it is. But take one bite and leave green there to feed more bugs and go on. But keep, don't just let it set there. Don't rest it to death. Fertilizer's been a quick fix, but getting the bugs out of the system is not gonna be, it's not gonna be quick. It's gonna be take a while to figure out how to, how to do it without bugs. 
So I, I just want to leave you the idea is that we haven't been doing it wrong, you know, I, but there's just new information out there now that we need to take advantage of. You know, so I'm not being critical. I mean, I'll probably go buy nitrogen fertilizer and fertilize some of my hay fields next spring. Not because I want to, it's because I just haven't figured out how to take those remote hay fields and figure out how to grow stuff out of it uh, without a disastrous hay yield. So I think we're in the process of learning, but we haven't got it all figured out yet, but there's more. We can buy inputs or we can use soil microbiology. And that's what we're kicking around, some of my things uh, that we can do with our hay fields. Uh, how can we make that brown mess that you saw up there look a lot better, okay? Change can be incremental. You don't need to do it all at once. And if you do go cold turkey, you will get the chills. <laughs> so be ready for it, okay? Learn practice four principles of the oil test. Keep it covered, plant diversity, tillage, minimum tillage, keep live roots. Grow, graze, and regrow. Those, it sounds so simplistic. I know you've been doing a bunch of it, but just really put it into everyday practice in your operation in terms of let that plant grow, then graze it, and let it regrow, and then graze it, and let it regrow, okay? That's how we're going to stimulate soil health. There's no end to the journey. It's, there's no end. It's just, you know, my talk is not the end. Hopefully it's just beginning some new thoughts and some new ideas on your, your end of the whole thing. And... Um, I really, you know, I'm sure many of you knew about soil health and you know about grazing. I just think there's a whole new window of opportunity how we can manipulate our grazing to not only help Audubon's birds and our profit line and our average daily gain of our steers we're trying to finish, but the soil bugs to actually make this whole system work even better. So I thank you for this opportunity and Denise and I will be happy to answer any questions.